So today is the fourth call to action as part of the World Food Safety Day celebrations. And one of the calls to actions that was posted by the WHO is eat it safe. And the fact that all consumers have the right to safe and nutritious food. And so today on the line, I have a number of uh, distinguished speakers that are all involved in this part of the food chain. They're all involved in making sure that consumers have the right to safe food. And the focus today is very much on the restaurant and hospitality and food service sector, where we know there have been some very drastic changes as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that it's only been recently in level three that restaurants have really been allowed to even do takeaways. Um, you know, before that, we've had to rely on deliveries. And before that, in level one, everyone was completely shut down. This has had a devastating impact on the sector. And we're going to be chatting today about the plans for recovery and um, you know, how we as the population of South Africa can actually play our part now in helping to revive this sector of the food industry. But we all enjoy our meals out. And um, unfortunately, statistics from around the world show us that the restaurant and hospitality sector do contribute to a significant number of cases of foodborne illness. And so there is a lot of attention that is necessary for the foods, the, this part of the food chain to ensure that food is safe. And so we're gonna be chatting to a number of people today about this particular aspect. I have Jane Russell um, on the line. Jane is the National Quality Risk Executive for Bid Food. Um, I have Donna Crockhart uh, from SGS. I have Anna Bigara, and she's chatting to us from the Mangasutu University of Technology. I have Wendy Alberts from the Restaurant Association, and I have Grace Harding from an organization called Restaurant Collective. And all these ladies are going to be talking to us about various aspects of food safety in the restaurant, hospitality, and food service sector. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, and that is Anna Begara. Now, Anna has the wonderful opportunity of being able to teach students about food safety at Mangasutu um, University of Technology. Um, Anna is, um, has been in, in academia um, since 2002. Her uh, focus is environmental health. Um, she's had a, a lot of experience uh, in working with environmental health practitioners and teaching upcoming environmental health practitioners. But before that, she's actually been in the trenches as a health inspector. We don't call them that anymore. Now we call them environment. Anna, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much, Linda, for your uh, introduction. Um, I am really going to highlight on a few points with regard to that uh, food safety is a shared responsibility, chat a bit about the MET support of food safety, the legal aspect of food safety and COVID-19, as well as some of the enforcement challenges that you may be finding. Mangasutu University is a university in the township of Umlazi, just south of Durban. Uh, near the old airport and we at MET support food safety by keeping abreast of new knowledge and practices through continuous professional development, networking, conferences and events such as these to this week, as well as to educate the future EHPs. These students undergo training both on campus and in the municipalities, uh, how to use equipment, how to conduct inspections, uh, regulatory aspects as well as enforcement where necessary with a strong focus on awareness and activities. Going on to the legal aspect of uh, food safety, why do we say municipalities? Most of us would know, be aware that um, food control is a core function of municipal health services, which is dictated to by the Health Act in the in district health system. Here we have the environmental health practitioners who are responsible for the inspection, investigation and compliance. And in terms of compliance, they would do it in, uh, as far as the Criminal Procedure Act and they have to have 
uh, peace officer certificates. The environmental health policy and the environmental norm, health norms and standards advocates for a risk-based approach, which is obviously what um, we are all aware of at the moment as well. And the EHP, in the scope of practice of the EHP, EHP is to ensure food safety. And the mechanisms used, legislation, we know the Food uh, FCD Act, and that inspectors are um, environmental health practitioners included. The R638 is obviously a key piece of legislation, especially in the restaurant business, where all licensed businesses have to be issued with a COA by the municipality, having complied with the various requirements, including um, the spatial development, town planning, etc. Today we are faced obviously with COVID-19 and here the Disaster Management Act takes precedence and regulations and, um, are made. In this particular case, the regulation relating to COVID-19 was first uh, gazetted on the, in, on the 17th of March. From then onwards, directions were issued and authorizations which would, which would be the ministers of the various uh, departments. So one of the key points uh, for, for us to obviously note is the adequate space requiring 1.5 meter and uh, one square meter per person in terms of social distancing, as well as the health protocols and enforcement. Um, and EHP, for example, would be able to enforce the 1.5 meter social distancing because they are a peace office certified. Um, the challenges of enforcement, uh, if we look at in, in these times of COVID, um, obviously these directives and authorizations can be very overwhelming and confusing for everyone. And, um, you know, just to follow the sequence sometimes is quite challenging. Um, uh, to note is that the health minister uh, put out directions to address and prevent and combat the spread of COVID. And from then onwards, everyone had to align towards prevention plans and, uh, uh, you know, transmission uh, mitigation, etc. So COVID-19 to the environmental health uh, sector, municipal health services involves the guidelines they were, that were put out on the 14th of April. And here it uh, indicates the role of the EHPs and how they are to uh, be involved in the management of COVID. And um, the contact uh, list tracing, as we all know, is a very important function. And uh, another very uh, sort of key area is environmental disinfection, which is section 3.2 then speaks to the National Public Health Hygiene Strategy and Implementation Plan. And this followed, a direct, followed by a directive as well, where the Minister of Health wrote to all the various departments, Department of Employment and Labor, Education, and uh, requested them to um, obviously put out directives specific to their departments and some of the enforcement challenges maybe relating to restaurants would be, for example, the Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Employment and Labor deals with the safe and um, environment where workers have to work without any risk. And there he put out some directives and these spoke to risk assessment, screening and keeping of a register. And obviously the workers, safety in the restaurant when they come in they have to be uh, checked etc and that kind of enforcement is by the inspector of the department of employment and labor in terms of section 28 of the occupational safety act so now the environmental health practitioner or municipal health service officials uh, only have guidelines and guidelines are not necessarily that easy to fall into the enforcement aspect. And the conflict may be when you're getting the various um, inspectors coming to see you and asking for different things. So um, 
the COVID regulations did uh, be, was was also amended, and contact tracing became a very important aspect. So if you have a worker that is um, been in contact with a COVID case or um, a suspect uh, COVID person, obviously you would have to provide the register and um, they would then follow up with tracing. And if you do have a positive COVID um, worker, then we know that the environmental disinfection becomes very important. You have to close down clean and sanitize and disinfect all the workplaces. I believe that the Department of Health is working on the legislative enforcement aspect thereof. So um, at the moment, in, in the EHPs in the municipalities are obviously focusing on the social distancing and the act, act, adequate space between um, workers especially with all the alerts where um, restaurants can only really provide takeaway, although they would still uh, dis uh, liaise with colleagues in the municipality who are at the call front of um, COVID-19 inspections, they do conduct the inspections and um, obviously apply what is uh, required. And um, having said that, I hope that it explains all the um, issues to do with the enforcement challenges and obviously we'll address it further with questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I, I think the, uh, you know, for the most part in terms of the EHP now having had to take on this very different role, it's uh, quite a challenge because we're so used to them coming in and we're, um, you know, them having the role of checking hygiene, but now all of a sudden they're coming in and they're checking social distancing. Um, and I think it's important for the restaurants to remember that you have this dual responsibility. They actually do wear more than one cap. And so because of that, um, you know, it's really important that we respect that that that, uh, that opportunity or rather that, that responsibility. I'm now going to hand over to Jane Russell. Um, and as I said, I've known Jane for a long time. Jane is one of my friends. She has a BSc in dietetics. She's worked in the food industry in a whole bunch of different ways, but currently she's responsible for quality and risk and health and safety at um, Bid Food at an executive level. And I know that Jane has always been passionate about the food service sector. So Jane, we want to understand the role of safe supply coming into the restaurants. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's that very important saying, garbage in and garbage out. How is food safety at a restaurant or food service um, environment affected by the controls that are in place for managing suppliers. Over to you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join today's um, presentations. And it's good to be involved with um, something that is close to my heart personally, but more importantly, that um, is very important to how we as consumers engage with the restaurant industry on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So what, why is food, safe food distribution so important? It's quite simple. It all starts with how we get the ingredients into our um, environment in, and be able to manipulate them into a delicious menu item that your customers will come back asking for more. So safe food distribution, it, it's where it all starts. It's got to be, food safety is often neglected in many of our um, in many smaller type of distributors operations where they think you know what we're just moving boxes around they actually forget that those are food boxes and that it's that food product that needs to be moved from a to b but more importantly um the food distributors role is all about making sure that suppliers who are utilizing their services for distribution are ensuring that they have got all the right food safety protocols, procedures, systems in place so that once that packaged food item arrives for distribution, the customer who is then going to receive those goods from the bid foods or whoever, whichever is a distributor of the world, will know that they've already gone through quality assurance checks and they don't have to have the burden of 
going back and checking the supply chain further up and making sure that the supplier is ticking all the boxes. So the food distributor takes an, on a very onerous role in ensuring the supplier quality assurance of anybody that they list into their um, supplier network to make sure that they are following the right protocols because at the end of the day the consumer protection act joins us all together at the hip we are all joint and severably liable for the safety of food for for our consumer or for you and i to be able to consume at a restaurant of our choice so bit food is a large national um, organization and bit food takes food safety very very seriously so today's presentation i'm going to look at how we fulfill a, a, a customer's pantry list. And Bit Food is, um, as I said, national. We've got uh, 15 different branches around the country in all the major centers. And it all starts with the goods coming in to the, to the warehouse, going through the, the checks and balances, making sure that our suppliers are compliant, storing it in facilities that are regulated that are audited regularly by independent as well as internal auditors, and then distributing it in a network or a fleet of vehicles that are um, where we manage the cold chain from start to finish, and which are the, the right suitable type of vehicles to distribute a broad basket of products. We, we distribute chilled, we just distribute frozen, and we distribute ambient products all out of the same vehicle. So we've got three different temperature regimes that need to be managed from start to finish. On some days, we can distribute up to 30 drops out of one vehicle. So it becomes quite a challenging um, operation for us to engage in where we never know what's around the next corner in terms of delays, setbacks, customers holding us up, um, traffic congestion, so it's all up to making sure that the infrastructure is working brilliantly. It's all about the safe ingredients um, for today's um, presentation, how are we going to get that there, and then what are our challenges as food distributors, and last but not least, and it's on everybody's mind, but what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the food distribution industry as a whole? So, as, a safe, as, our safe, as I said, we are a supply chain partner. We don't like to be called just a distributor. We like to know that we are part and parcel of our customers' business. We like to know that um, we've got our customers at heart, their interests and their welfare. And we have implemented a very well-integrated food safety management system through our business, which, as I said, starts at supply evaluation goes through our, to our business operations, into our cold chain um, vehicle um, distribution, and networked around that, we have a whole range of different solutions that our customers can draw on at any point in our relationship. They can go into our e-commerce platform to engage with us online, to be able to place their orders, understand where their order is, track their order, and even pay online. So it really makes life a lot simpler. We have not only a large range of national supplier and manufacturer products, but we also have a, a big basket of private label products as well, which are manufactured under license to for bid food and are exclusively available only from bid food. We have um, we take customer complaints very seriously. We um, have a customer complaint management system that tracks um, a customer's complaint from the time that he logs a complaint all the way through to that it's being resolved. And we integrate that relationship with our suppliers so that the supplier and the customer become part of the, the process of resolving complaints quickly, efficiently, and with the main purpose of ensuring that we mitigate any risk to the consumer, as well as helping prevent it from happening again. I mean, after all, the food industry is managed by people, so there will always be a factor of human error that comes into play, but it's, about, it's always about mitigating the risk associated with that error. So food safety in the supply chain is something that is integral to our business culture. It, um, it happens daily, it ha happens ongoingly, and we are continually developing and evolving our systems to make sure that they are robust.
What are our, dis our challenges, though, is that um, there are inconsistent industry standards. There's also inconsistent enforcement. So it's all very well as a large national and listed entity to have to comply with all the, the re regulatory requirements, but that doesn't always apply to the smaller operators the person that um, starts up and, and goes off to a wholesaler, buys a whole lot of products and starts to sell them off, off the back of their bucky. We, fam we um, familiarly call them the bucky brigade, but it's a challenge because the standards are not equal. So when you are running an, an, an operation that is well managed and that has got all the checks and balances in place, those things cost money. And at the end of the day, the, the guy operating off the back of his bucky doesn't have the same overhead. So it comes down to the price inevitably. And um, it, it means that we, we just have to fight a lot harder and we have to educate our customers and our suppliers in terms of what we require and that we will not forsake food safety for price at any, at any cost. So the fragmented food safety standards are not only felt in the distribution channel, but it's also felt by our suppliers who, who, who yearn to follow what is required, but also yearn to do as, uh, as much as they can afford to do. The changing regulations move the goalposts constantly for us, and with new assignee bodies coming on board, inspecting us at every left turn, um, a day in the life of a food service operator or distributor can be, become quite challenging. Um, we also are encouraged and we want to, to develop new suppliers to get them up to speed, and often that drags um, us back a little bit in terms of not being able to deliver their products when they want them delivered because they don't have the necessary food safety uh, credentials and standards in place. And overall, uh, one thing that I know is close to Linda's heart is that we need to build a food safety culture in the industry. And at times it feels that we're just totally, totally lacking in that department. But we're getting there one, one day at a time and one step at a time. And it's up opportunities like this that we get to engage and make sure that we can get the message across and make everybody start working together as and working as one makes a big difference. So what happened? On the 15th of March, we were um, all glued to our TV sets watching the President's address and they declared a state of um, disaster and we went into the full impact of COVID-19. It had arrived in on the South African shores two weeks prior to that and we were starting to start getting our heads around how we're going to continue managing our businesses and our lives. On the, on the first day of um, national lockdown, the 27th of March, Bid Food stayed open. We were ready. We were ready to fight the fight and take it on. But that wasn't true of what had happened to our customers overnight. Overnight, we lost 80% of our business. 80% of our customers' doors closed, and hopefully they will be temporarily closed and are gradually starting to reopen. But the biggest sector that remains closed is the sit-down restaurant industry. And it's for that industry that we are fighting daily to try and reopen it. 80% closure of customers meant an enormous impact on our, on our business turnover and our business structure. Our first priority was obviously to protect our staff, to make sure that we'd put in all the COVID-19 protocols that had, been, uh, that had been regulated by both the Department of Health as well as the Department of Employment and Labor. We had to train our staff. We've been telling people to wash our hands and wash their hands forever. I mean, those of us that have been in the food safety industry, <laughs> it's like, well, we've told them all along, why didn't they do it? And at the end of the day, it boiled down to the simpl simplicity of people should be washing their hands a lot more often in order to control the spread of this infectious disease. We had to train people, we had to issue PPE, we had to start wearing masks, we had to tell people to stop standing so close to each other and stop hugging each other hello when they arrived to visit, to have a meeting. We had to stagger our employee, employees' shifts 
because we couldn't afford to have all our employees on a site at one stage. And if one person tested COVID positive, we would have to send everybody home and shut our doors and not be able to supply the essential services that we're fighting on and continuing to operate where to implement health screening. We had a lot of questions asked, why do you want to take my temperature? This is invading my privacy. People didn't understand it as we saw it as being necessary to follow the protocols to, to stave off the, the, infection, the, the rate of infection. People started to work from home. That became a whole new normal. And we had to keep constantly motivating and counseling people. We have over 350 sales consultants in our business. A sales consultant needs people in order for them to do their business. And suddenly they were sitting at home running um, Teams meetings and Zoom meetings, trying to just to keep contact with their customers while their customers' doors were, were closed, but just telling them that we're in the background waiting to support them. Communication to our customers was of paramount importance. We had to keep them updated what was happening. We had to start engaging on difficult topics like how, how are you going to pay us for the goods that we delivered to you in, up to the 26th of March because we've got to keep the lights on and keep our employees paid. And we had to become innovative. And luckily we are surrounded with people with a lot of passion within our business and we uh, we saw the birth of the Bid Food home delivery. We are not a consumer facing business. You don't see our brands in retail. You don't know about Bid Food in retail. You don't even know that Bid Food made the delivery to the restaurant door before you sat down and ordered your meal. But suddenly Bid Food Home was born and our trucks were starting to make home deliveries, supplying restaurant grade products to, to households that couldn't get their hands on product because of shortages or because people didn't want to leave their homes for fear of safety. And last but not least, we started a whole new channel in our business, and that was starting to pack food hampers for various NGOs. So suddenly our warehouses packed full to the brim um, with product that we want to sell suddenly became um, packing lines, and we started delivering food hampers into the needy communities that we support. But last but, not, and last but not least, we've learned to, to talk to people within our industry. We suddenly started having open conversations with people that we never before engaged with for whatever reason. We were so busy running our business and they were so run, busy run, running their businesses. But suddenly we need to support each other. So we've, we've taken on a, a supportive role as Bid Food to engage with industry leadership and industry bodies to be able to collaborate and facilitate between parties to start working as one force so that the powers that be, be it the Minister of Tourism, be it the Minister of Trade and Industry, or be it the President himself, can see that this is a well-structured industry sector, that the food industry is serious about what we say and that we don't pay lip service to food safety. We've never paid lip service to food safety and we certainly don't pay lip service to COVID-19 controls and requirements that the government has asked us to implement for the safety of ourselves and the safety of others. And so through innovation and the use of technology, we hope to be able to propose a, a new way of doing business for our restauranteurs so that they can get their doors open, so that the waitrons can start going back to work and start earning the salaries to keep their families fed and warm through the next couple of months. So together we are stronger. We are a force as industry, no matter what role we play within the food chain. And we need to stick together and speak as one, with one voice so that we can get those doors open again. Thank you. So Donna, over to you, thanks. Hi everybody. So thank you, Linda, for having me talk today. Um, so you've asked me to talk about the role of third party auditing in the restaurants um, in terms of producing safe food. So just, you know, to say that I have great empathy for the restaurant sector at the moment. Um, it really has been a devastating impact on them, um, job losses and, and um, all sorts of uh, issues. And, you know, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. Um, I spend a lot of time at restaurants. Um, you know, Friday afternoon, 
having a drink, enjoying a meal. So I, I'm desperate to get back into the restaurants. And um, so, yes, I, I really I really have great empathy for them and, um, and all the efforts that they're making to in lobbying in, in getting table service again. So just very quickly in terms of the impact to an auditing body, a certification body um, when, when uh, lockdown happened. Um, so basically we um, literally closed doors. We all work from home at the moment. Um, auditors um, were sitting at home up until level, sort of level four and then coming into level three, there's some activity. So, you know, as a certification body, we had to get um, very, uh, develop processes very quickly to accommodate remote services, remote inspection, remote auditing. Um, but, you know, just an indication, you know, our revenues, particularly in my business line, we went from, you know, it was basically a 95, 99% impact, no revenue. So we, we also felt it, um, but we are there supporting the industry with all our e-learning um, options, our virtual um, instructor-led training, and then of course our remote services. So yes, um, then just in terms of the, the, the role of third-party auditing, um, Linda, do I need to click? Yes, just okay, just click. great. Click the left, so, left mouse button and then up and down arrows to move the slides. Thanks, Donna. Okay. Is it changing? Not yet. There we go. There we go. Okay. So just in terms of the role of third party auditing, um, so we're basically there to, to validate um, to do an independent verification or valid validation against a specific standard. Um, and you know, the, the independence is, the, we add that value in terms of its consistency, the competence, um, following best practice, because very often these, these um, services are offered by certification bodies or auditing body, bodies that have um, standards in place um, against uh, 17021 or 19011. Um, and the impartiality of these processes is really important. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, comp the impartiality and the fair presentation and the ethics is really the foundation of integrity and the professional service that gets offered. Um, the process offers uh, credibility and integrity. Um, and then, of course, there's the the recognition um, that an organize, organization would receive in terms of um, being audited by an independent body. And then of course, it allows the business to focus on what they're good at and to release their resources. So just in terms of what's happening in the rest of the world, um, so when COVID-19 um, came about, the World Health Organization published their, their guidance um, on the 7th of April to food business. We also have um, the FDA, they published some really nice little checklists that are freely available on the internet um, for reopening for restaurants and retail. And then we have, of course, the, the codex guidelines, which will apply as standard. But also the one that's getting a little bit of attention when you when you do your searching is the guidelines on the application of general principles of food hygiene to control um, viruses in food. And then, of course, um, you know the restaurants um, in a lot of countries around the world, particularly in Europe and Australia, they have their food hygiene ratings, which are very um, visibly displayed to consumers. The, the regulatory requirements would obviously apply um, in the, 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 the country. The, then they would have the government schemes, like I said, in terms of the, the scores on doors. And then of course, there are a lot of private schemes that take place, second party auditing, customer specific um, requirements. 
um, that would apply, um, especially with the, the larger um, multinational franchisee-type um, organizations. Um, and, and, you know, in the rest of the world, enforcement is quite um, stringent. So the, just this is just a visual, sorry about the bad quality of the, the, the images, but this was just really to show the, the very fast um, impact that happened when, when lockdown occurred. The, these images are from the United States and how um, radical that was to the, to the sector. And then I'm sure um, it was no different in South Africa. So just um, with the rest of the world, um, these are the types of things that are happening. You've got the uh, social distancing, the efforts that are being made. Um, you know, you've got your waitresses wearing masks and all these um, controls. And then, of course, the, that one on the left-hand corner is, the, is what they've done in Amsterdam. They've got those um, glass cubicles where you can go and sit and, um, and dine. And then um, the... The interesting part is that they, they charge charging the surge, what COVID-19 surcharge, which has been um, a consideration in South Africa, but I haven't particularly seen it as yet. And then of course, um, there are, um, there's a lot of growth in um, the third party. For example, SGS has partnered with Radisson Hotels where we um, monitor the disinfection program and then we actually issue a mark, um, you know, when they achieve a certain standard and, and um, it, you know, it involves the a re remote part of the um, inspection, um, some swabs and ATP testing, and then we also sampling for the, the SARS CoV-2. Then I just thought this was really interesting um, in terms of litigation, um, and I took this from Bill Marler's blog, because I was interested to know what um, what he's saying and in terms of its impact on food safety. So it's really going to be difficult to prove that you would that you get COVID from a for being in a in a restaurant due to the um, incubation period. So if you look at that last paragraph um, where he says that we haven't got any calls where somebody's saying, I've got COVID, I think I got it at a restaurant. They're rather getting the calls from people who said that they got food poisoning and didn't go to the hospital because they were afraid they would get COVID. So, you know... I'm worried. That's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that actually concerns me and it really touches on, um, you know, Jane, where you, you raised the issues of food safety culture because... It indicates to me that um, possibly that food safety is going to take that back seat again. And um, so just going on to South Africa, um, you know, not to repeat what Anna's uh, uh, presented, but, you know, in terms of the restaurants, we're looking at the R638 and their certificate of acceptability. And then, of course, the the COVID controls that we have to impl implement in the workplace um, to protect employees and the spread of the virus. And then, of course, we also have private schemes in South Africa, second party auditing, customer specific requirements. However, the, the regulations, as we know, are not well enforced, difficult to enforce. They have their challenges. And that is why it's really important that um, restaurants and the franchisees um, are proactive and they implement these um, second party schemes, private schemes, third party auditing to do the verification for them. Then I just thought I would show the, um, the when the government published their risk adjusted strategy and how they um, categorized the different industries um, in deciding in, in when they would um, reopen these, these sectors. So if you can see the, the hotels, restaurants and retail takeaways, we're right up there in terms of their scoring, in terms of risk. Um, those bullet points on the right are the, um, what they used to determine those, that scoring. So 
um, example, it, the percentage of employees that can work remotely. Obviously, in a restaurant situation, employees can't work remotely. Um, and then the geographies and the ability to enforce social distancing, um, wearing of masks and screening of employees, etc. So, um, in terms of an auditing company, what we've done is we've Yes, there was the quick um, entry of our services back into um, the markets at the bottom of the uh, graph. Um, so those those markets remain active and doing the remote auditing, and there's some on-site auditing still taking place, um, slowly but surely. But what we're doing is we're really focusing on the top part of that uh, uh, graph to create some awareness on how we can support the industry to motivate the re-entry back into um, um, trade, if I could say, um, because I think customers are generally looking for that assurance that um, things are in place. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, just in terms of uh, consumers, um, you know, I've, I've done some research on, on, on some of the surveys that, they, that are taking place. So the main concerns in terms of going back to a restaurant relates mostly to safety and hygiene and employee hygiene. Um, and then, of course, uh, going back to what the, the Bill Marler slide, where they're not really concerned about the food safety issues, they're confer concerned about COVID. So on this slide, I just really wanted to show that, um, and Linda, I actually changed um, what you've asked me to, to talk about. You asked me to talk about how can we leverage COVID for food safety? And I want to say that we should be using food safety for COVID because if a business has um, the food safety management systems in place, by default, you, 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 you're 80% there in terms of COVID control. Um, so if you look at the basic food safety controls that need to be in place, um, those processes, if you look at personal hygiene, if we're taking care of that, you're gonna take care of the, a lot of the COVID um, personal hygiene requirements, um, the illness reporting um, and those type, the, the, the protective clothing, taking care of protective clothing, and that type of thing. Um, the challenges for the restaurant sector will really come into the customer service area where now you've got to have the social distancing um, in place. Cleaning and sanitation, you know, it's, it's, it's been there, done that, the industry is doing it, they know how to do it, um, they should be doing it. So same thing, if you're taking care of it in your food safety management system, you're going to take care of it in terms of the, the, the COVID controls. Um, in terms of the HACCP plan, you would have had to uh, relook at your risks and the cross-contamination of the virus. And then, of course, uh, it, with the COVID controls, the necessary requirements for management commitment, the involvement of the people, the uh, training of the staff, and then, of course, the business continuity. So, um, so that you know that, that that that's really what I wanted to sort of stress is that it's so important that um, the restaurant sector have their food safety management systems in in place. And if you do, COVID's going to be somewhat easy. If you don't have food safety management systems in place, I think the COVID controls are going to be a challenge a challenge for the sector. So it's sort of a bittersweet. Um, it's sort of bittersweet for me that um, we need to use COVID to leverage um, food safety. Um, and you know, just to to reaffirm that if 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 the food business have these have these food safety management systems in place, with underpinned by the PRPs and the regulatory requirements. Um, you're good to go. Um, in terms of your food safety, your, your COVID interventions, you need to make sure that you review food safety in mind um, and make sure that the, uh, the, the integrity of the food chain, um, ensuring the protection of the workers and preventing exposure. 
Um, and then the COVID con controls can definitely strengthen food hygiene and sanitation. Um, so, so COVID itself will impact food safety due to um, the social distancing, because um, you know what, what we've seen uh, specifically in the meat industry, where there's a very intense um, uh, manual inspection taking place. There's been a huge impact there because of the reduction of inspectors, and then of course the impact on on the workforce um, being off sick. So that's really all I have to say, and um, thank you so much again. And um, I'm happy to support anybody with any questions. So um, over to you, Grace. We can't hear. I can't wait to hear about this new opportunity called Restaurant Collective and how this is going to assist with food safety in the sector. Over to you. Thanks, Grace. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I find it very weird that I can't see everybody. <laughs> it's very strange for me. So before I share some information which Linda's asked me to share, um, I must first say two things. The first thing is, Boy, oh boy, have I learned a shitload in the last 67 days. Wow. Um, and so much about all the all the initiatives and all the specialists out there that can really, really make the sit-down restaurant sector so much stronger. Um, I think what I've realized is how little we don't know and how slack we are in many, many cases. So that's the first thing. The second thing is because I can't see people, um, I'm really curious to know what kind of things that you guys are thinking about, you, uh, the, the audience, the people who are participating, you know, um, do you have one thing that you'd really love to know more about? Is there something you're really concerned about? Do you have an idea? So as I speak, um, I would just love to see in the chat section any thoughts just to vomit them out because usually when I um, start sharing stuff, I always start off by saying, you know, let's just all check in with each other and see what do we want, what are we curious about, um, because in some ways I do believe we are all COVIDed out. So um, I don't know how I can see the chat little okay, thing. Yeah, don't stress, um, Grace. We'll keep you updated with the comments that are okay. coming in. Everybody out there, cool. please use your question bar and jot down your thoughts and ideas and suggestions and concerns, as Grace has mentioned, and we'll make sure she hears all about them. Yeah. Go for it, Grace. Cool, because then I, then I know if it's relevant or not. So um, I'm here in my capacity as someone who's part of something called the Restaurant Collective. Uh, it's a bunch of sit down restaurant people who just got together and uh, towards the end of April. And we thought to ourselves, gee, you know, what are we gonna do first about COVID? The other reason we got together is we thought, what are we gonna do about the landlords? So that's also one of the most common little moans out there. We're either fighting with the landlords or the aggregators. Um, and now our attention is turned to asking government, why can people sit next to each other on airplanes for many hours, but they can't go to a restaurant? So um, it was started by Natasha Sideris from Tasha's and myself. And, you know, in a few days, we had to get our heads around so much. The biggest thing we realized is a sit-down restaurant industry is fragmented. And I think we are lumped together with the common term of restaurants. So a restaurant is anything from a pub to a tavern, to a takeaway, to a fast casual environment. And the one thing we know when it comes to the big, big takeaway brands in this country, be they the South African brands like the amazing Steers brand, or be they the McDonald's and Burger Kings, their systems and processes are just much more slick than the sit down restaurant industry. This industry was formed by passionate people who came from overseas, the incredible Italians and Greeks and Portuguese. And the restaurant industry was built on passion, love, glorious food, and lots of whiskey and wine. And I think we've had to grow up. And it's wonderful to listen to. Um, the, the independent auditing and all the other standards that are out there. And what I thought I would do is I would just share a few things that we are thinking about, but the greatest benefit I'm getting so far is to see the people we need to connect with. 
because by uplifting the quality of the restaurant industry, it obviously is going to uplift the industry as a whole. So I'll share some of the stuff that we're working on, and then I'd love to see if anyone needs to hear anything. So very interesting. It's not so easy to get up to date data. The one thing I think that we don't have is data. Um, when the press started speaking to me and asking me about how many sit down restaurants and how many this and how many that, it's really a guessing game. And um, we all know that without data, how do we even know where to begin? So this is some Euro monitor information I found. So this is quite a good guesstimate. I mean, if you look at a coffee shop and a bar where people do sit down, although it's not a true restaurant, I mean, we're looking at like 30,000 outlets out there, probably employing an average of about 20 people each. So it's a massive industry and there's a huge opportunity to regulate it, to implement some form of star grading system. I think um, on the SGS presentation, I noticed, um, Donna, that you said that um, in America, I think they have to publicly list their score of their audit. I mean, that would be amazing. I've been to visit a few restaurants in the last few weeks um, with some of uh, the Ocean Basket training team, and it's been a huge eye opener. And even as, as Ocean Basket, where I'm accountable, we've come a long way in terms of food safety. So I actually thought the best way of sharing very quickly without talking too much, what is the restaurant collective about is I'd share our little strategy house with everybody. Um, and over the next few weeks, we're gonna work on all these buckets of work. Um, at the moment, we just focused on getting the industry ready to open and getting Cyril to agree. So let me show you this little picture. So we call ourselves the restaurant collective and our objective is not just to get through COVID. COVID is, is the gift we received. You know what did Churchill say? Never let a crisis go to waste. But COVID definitely woke us up. Boy, oh boy, I could spend an hour or two with many bottles of wine, now that we can buy it, and explain what I have realized about the sit-down restaurant industry. So we want to build a vibrant sit-down restaurant industry. We want to be an industry where people want to work, not where people just land up working there because, well, there's nowhere else to work or I didn't get a good matric. But it's really, we want it to be an, a career opportunity of choice. Um, we've already set up um, a restaurant management training program. Um, our head of training and education at Ocean Basket, um, we've just announced two days ago, we got it accredited by the CETA. So it's a recognized mini diploma in restaurant management and we can't wait to share that with other members of the sit down restaurant industry so there's a whole bunch of points there i'm not going to go through all of them um and i'm sure a lot of you have worked with this model before it's, it's a form of a balanced scorecard but the performance measurement section is everything we'd like to achieve um, and it's going to be a lifetime of achievement or a lifetime of work we, you know, we've got to really get organized and get this show on the road. And then we've got our four focus areas, productive and motivated workforce, the sustainable sit down model. Uh, the restaurant industry really has changed a lot. I mean, gone are the days where you can have these sprawling kitchens and, you know, lots and lots of tables and a long menu. It's just not affordable anymore. And food safety is absolutely critical. I mean, what I've learned about cold chain and monitoring a product from the minute it is, where, whether it's seafood, from the minute it's caught to the minute it's eaten, or whether it's anything else. And we've had lots of food scares, obviously, in the last few years. So I just put a little pink circle around safe and enjoyable guest experience, because that's relevant to the Food Focus webinar today. And these are the things that we want to do. In terms of the COVID health and safety measures, they have been documented, they have been submitted um, via FedHASA to the Department of Tourism. What I realize is I've, I've never sat with somebody like a donor, and I think that that's so important. Um, I've realized now that whoever's going to be policing safety, um, we, they all need to get the same brief so that everybody's on the same page. 
Um, and these are some of the other things that we're going to do to ensure safe and enjoyable guest experience. Consistent food safety standards and practices um, and other things like service standards, gradings, um, health and safety, healthy environment. So, yes, I do think that COVID has given us all a nice wake-up call. And we've got a lot of work to do, and I can only sit, speak for sit-down restaurants because that's my world. But I think we've started something good. We are collaborating with incredible people, the generosity of people like Bid Food, who are helping us build an app and doing incredible stuff for us, and meeting all sorts of other restaurant owners who just want to get together and share ideas and create a really desirable and quality sit-down restaurant experience in South Africa. So that's all I have to say about that, as Forrest Gump said. From the broader aspects of the Restaurant Association of South Africa. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that's on the panel and for inviting us and for recognizing the role that we play in the industry. Um, Roz has been around for a long time, 15 years, and the purpose really of our engagement is to offer proper content and direction and to provide a framework for best practices within the industry. The coronavirus has certainly disseminated the restaurant industry over the last couple of weeks, um, that the restaurant industry has certainly suffered the most significant job losses, sales, um, and we've had to transform our businesses from being sit-down restaurants into alternative operations like being takeaway or being delivery services and now being bottle store delivery opportunities, et cetera. And I think that this has led itself to a whole bunch of um, difficult processes for us to be able to operate within. And it's not the true nature of our business. So we've had to look and we've had to align ourselves in ways that we can certainly ensure that we manage all the challenges that we faced within this industry on a daily basis. The 11 weeks has really taught us um, dramatic um, changes that we've had to lobby for and uh, try and help the restaurant industry and it's been a learning curve for everybody you know and what we've learned is that restaurants are an integral part of the economy that it's an invaluable part of society and an invaluable part of the tourist platform i think that finally the government has acknowledged the role that we play in the gdp as well as employment practices and having said all of this i think that even though we're facing an uncertain future we've opened up very very open lines of dialogue that indicates information that we receive both from the restaurants here as well as government as well as third party as well as suppliers in terms of putting together a framework that speaks to us about our robust industry post-COVID and I think this is important conversation and dialogue that we need to move forward to build a blueprint for recovery post-2020 and we're focusing on the restaurant future 2030 and it's a program that we are certainly very passionate about and we look forward to a lot of the partners that are working with us in the industry to be able to build the frame, framework. We've got many, many resources available at the Restaurant Association, um, and it helps us to assess the immediate needs of what the industry needs straight away. And I think if we look at one of the key aspects with COVID, we were one of the industries hit the hardest, yet we were one of the industries that were quick to put the health protocols in place to bring self-regulation into ensuring that health and safety was a top priority for all our restaurants, for their staff and the customers. And I think this is important because one of the key things is that we have to talk about consumer behavior and leading forward and how important it is to ensure that the communication and messages that we put out to the consumer is one that will allow them to feel safe to come back and support the restaurants once we open for sit down. I think we've managed this communication and content and dialogue very well in the process of both delivery and sit down. And through that, we've had sufficient support, not support to be able to manage the framework of the financial model that we're within, but just managing the consumer behavior where they feel that they that it's safe enough to be able to support the restaurants within our industry. I think that it's a, a huge time for us in the restaurant sector to reinvent the restaurant industry. What we have learned is that we're never going to return to any part of our restaurants the way it is. And I think these are pertinent issues that we need to look at and how we manage the role that we have with government and the role that we have with suppliers and the role we have with the consumers to redefine the blueprint of what we have and how we bring sustainability to survive in the restaurant industry. And part of this is really the creation of a healthy message to the consumer 
in understanding where they're going to lead us. And we've, we've looked and tracked a whole lot of international trends. But as we continue to learn about operating through COVID, we're going to learn how to redefine our business through experts like Ecolab, SGS, IHSS. And the role that they play is very, very important in stabilizing and mobilizing health and hygiene and safety issues within the restaurant industry. And I think all parts of, of trying to get the industry to reopen at every single level is really by engaging with the experts and looking at frameworks where we can present the readiness for our industry to open. I think we, we've proven to government that operationally we, we certainly are ready and we've communicated this through all aspects of, of the 11 weeks that we've been running, that food safety, cleaning, sanitizing, the employee health, um, monitoring, personal hygiene, social distancing are imminent of who we are long before COVID took place in any event. And I think the part here really is for all players in this health sector to make proper industry representation to show that we, no matter what, what association we belong to, wherever we are, whether we're fragmented or not, is that we've properly consulted with each other to come up with a consulted framework that shows we've got proper training, proper material, proper PPE, proper certification. So whether we do like Donna suggested and we have the measurements outside and applications can be made for it, that the information that we have at hand has been both consulted internationally and local. And it gives proper, proper guidance, strong policies and procedures for us to be able to mitigate the risks against us. And that we can prove that even though they've opened other sectors in the, the industry, that we as an industry stand together and that we're also able to um, prove that we are operationally ready to open. I think this is one of the key aspects that we've learned from governments is that they want proper consultation through the industry together in, forms, in, in, in a formation that allows us to present a detailed document that allows us to build the industry moving forward from this in a very safe and prosperous way. And I think that the certification process and the documentation that we need to put out there needs to be in conjunction with the likes of players that are sitting on the forum as well as other industry leaders. Um, if I look at the 11 weeks, we certainly as an industry have displayed um, the key process in, in having a good relationship with government and we've been very respectful in the request that they've made for us to to transform our businesses into one being only delivery and two being only takeaway and now doing alcohol deliveries etc and we've shown huge appreciation for the relationship that we have with government and we've got to continue to build on these aspects and to educate government in the role that restaurants play and for them to understand how the framework of a restaurant works you know, we, we cannot continue to transform the businesses into takeaways and, and parts of delivery because a financial model just doesn't suffice. And that leads us where we've disseminated the restaurant industry and completely crippled the restaurant industry, which means that we're seeing hundreds of restaurants closing down and the viability of restaurants going forward and to, to be able to look for solutions to keep the, the industry afloat. And I think this is going to be a very, very strong challenge. Um, and our role is, is definitely to engage in many different solutions and to find proper direction advice that will be able to help restaurants to survive through COVID and post COVID. And I think there's a lot of things that we're going to still learn as we go through the wave of COVID. You know, we haven't seen the damage yet and we haven't really got there yet. Um, and we've already suffered such significant loss. Um, it's a very un uncertain future for everybody in the restaurant industry. And I think that we need to continue to get proper content and direction and to provide a, a full framework that we can lead and guide the restaurants um, to move through this next space, to become um, confident again in the operations that we, we run. I think that we, we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty with our restauranteurs, and we really need to look at the immediate needs of the industry, and in particular with the health protocols that we can assist with self-regulation between the private sector and with government in order to be able to allow restaurants to be able to operate within a framework that does allow us to be deemed as a safe environment for people to to come part you know we can't afford at this stage to lose our beautiful restaurant industry you know we we are definitely the forefront of the community of of neighborhoods we we are the camps bay boulevard with the parkhurst restaurant sector with the restaurants in the menlin and without restaurants there certainly is um, going to be a huge gap in the economy etc and just to to sort of put you in in the framework of the challenges that we've dealt with over the last 11 weeks. 
um, and how difficult it is at every turn for a restaurant to be able to survive and how desperate we are to engage with third parties or government to be able to create a healthy environment for our restaurants to trade through COVID. You know, we've been dealing obviously on the landscape of businesses and restaurants at, at a forefront, not to be able to transform our businesses for us to operate outside of the framework of what a restaurant is, which is bums on seats and the experiential engagement that you have with the restaurant to come in and enjoy a meal in a sit down environment. We've obviously been dealing with the consumer behavior, the challenges with the landlords, the challenges with the insurance companies not being able to match and meet their responsibilities. We've been dealing with the, a number of unemployed, of our beautiful people that are sitting at home that just simply cannot get back to work. And we've got to continue to train and, and allow our industry to be able to train staff that are still on unpaid layoff and give them skills and develop these beautiful skills. So we've certainly engaged in a number of um, supply engagements to do short skill courses to multi-skill a number of staff that are still on unpaid layoff, that they can be a barman and a barista, or they can do a, a wine course, or they can do a short um, food handlers course, or they can do health and hygiene, or they can do a COVID specialist course. And I think it's important that we keep the skills set up, that we bring credibility in the framework for, for the employees within our industry. We've also dealt with the liquor licenses, we've dealt with the supply chain disruption, the regulations and the PUC, and we just want to save the restaurant industry and uh, help as many people we can with the difficulties and contextual issues that they've got and look for a way to bring sustainability um, in the future of South African restaurants and what, what the industry is going to look like in 2030. Thanks, Wendy. That's really great. We appreciate your uh, giving us the, the feedback in terms of the the difficulties that you faced and I, I think again you know as Jane pointed out there there's aspects that the average South African I think has been completely unaware of and um, thank you very much for for highlighting that I think from our perspective as uh, food safety bandits we can just uh, sincerely hope that going forward the foundation of your plan will include the much needed focus on food safety which has not been the top priority um, we do appreciate that, obviously, in, for many indus, for many restaurants, it's all about surviving. Um, and I think the only concern that I would have going forward in this new set era is, could food safety be compromised for the sake of um, economic survival? And how would that impact, again, on the consumer and the need to ensure that this is not the case? I'm just going to pose um, a couple of questions. Donna, you mentioned in your presentation that there's a whole bunch of things happening overseas. I take it by implication there's nothing happening here. Well, um, you know what? Very little in... So the larger franchisees, yes, they, they, they're doing stuff. You know, they've got food safety, um, internal programs going on um, because, you know, they've got a, a huge brand to protect. So I really worry about the rest of the sector because I think they are um, somewhat reticent in terms of uh, the food safety implementation, whether it is a cost issue because of the low margins or whether the lack of resources within their business with the knowledge. Um, I think it does overwhelm them. And, um, you know, I think there's also a misunderstanding of quality versus food safety. Um, and so yes, I mean, I know we've we've touched on it quite a few times, but I'm really I'm really concerned that, and of course it's important. The whole COVID controls and what have you is extremely important. Um, but but I'm I'm worried that food safety is going to take the back seat again. And we all know the numbers. I mean, 420,000 people die a year of food poisoning, and um, you know that's that's a lot of people. And the problem is, is that, um, you know, consumers are not necessarily well educated. Consumers are not reporting food, food poisoning incidents. It's very difficult to, to, to prove food poisoning from a certain establishment. Um, I mean, we all know the complexities around that. 
but that doesn't excuse us from doing the right thing. And I think that's really, you know, the point of, of World Food Safety Day and this whole program is to make sure that we do take some time out to focus on the fact that food safety is a fundamental requirement for the success of our businesses, whether you are a one man coffee shop with five tables or whether you are a multinational, um, you know, whether you even have the prized Michelin star, um, food safety is fundamental for the enjoyment of your patrons. And so we look forward to seeing the restaurant industry um, move into the, you know, the new normal. I think, as Donna mentioned, we're all missing it very much. Um, and I know that as average, the average South Africans, we will definitely be doing all we can to support their business going forward because we have appreciate the impact that it has had on the economy and we think you know about all the people that have been personally affected at this time for those that have continued to offer delivery services and for those that have, have uh, that are now open for takeaways we wish you well we say hashtag thank you for our food um, and we sincerely looking forward to you know a, a fantastic opportunity for the restaurant industry to to transform in many ways as Wendy has put out we look forward to this framework highlighting amazing new um, opportunities within the restaurant industry and we sincerely hope that the foundation of this framework will be food safety. So thank you very much for listening to our webinar today. Thank you, ladies. It's been great having all of you. Thank you for your time. Um, and you can look out for this recording. It will be posted on our page.